This video is for the higher level content from D1.3 on mutations and gene editing with a special focus on gene editing. Before we can edit genes, we have to know two things. We need to know where a gene is located within the genome, and we need to know what it does. In order to find the location or where the gene is located, a process called open reading frame is used. So what we're looking for here are characteristic base sequences that usually start a gene, okay? So we can look for patterns here. Gene knockout is the um, technique that we'll talk a lot more about that is used to determine the function of the gene. Because once you know where a gene is located, all you have is the base sequences. Understanding the function of that gene requires a much different technique. The whole thought process of gene knockout and determining the function is basically to compare organisms with that gene to organisms that don't have that gene and see how they are different. So we want to take an embryo, and it's important that you use an embryo because changes to the embryo will also be repeated in all the cells made from that embryo, right? So that's what we want. So in that embryo, we want to delete one copy of that target gene. So let's Let's say it's a gene that I'm using with this capital letter B, okay? Um, we inherit two alleles for each gene, so a normal cell would have two copies of that gene. What we're doing in gene knockout is we are eliminating one of those genes from the embryo. So the embryo will only have one copy of that gene, not two. Okay, and then we wanna grow it into adults and we wanna breed two adults together, each that are having a missing gene. So if I put them into a Punnett square, that's going to look something like this. One adult will have B and then nothing where the other cop or the other allele should be. And the same with the other individual, okay? A copy of that gene and then nothing. So you can see that when we complete this Punnett square to talk about the genotypes created in the offspring, we're going to find that some of the offspring have two copies, like they should. Some of the offspring only have one copy when they should have two, and some of them have no copies. So once I have that, I can compare those individuals together, okay, or even this versus this, and whatever physiological differences I'm noting, I can attribute to that missing gene, and voila, I have found the function of that gene called gene knockout. Mice make really good um, uh, experimentation animals for gene knockout. They have a very short generation time, plus they have a lot of the same physical characteristics as human. Um, so do yeast, okay? So I know you don't feel like you have a lot in common with yeast, but um, you do quite a significant portion of your genome, and again, a very um, short generation time. So this is gene knockout. Now that we know where genes are and what they do, we can alter them. We can modify those genes using something called CRISPR and Cas9. So CRISPR is a segment of DNA. It's highly repetitive and very complex. And Cas9 is an enzyme um, that kind of guides this complex along a strand of DNA. And we'll talk about two applications of the use of CRISPR. One is for finding and altering genes. So this is the search and replace method. If I have a gene that is faulty or doesn't, um, or it codes for some polypeptide um, that is not the version that is helpful, then we might use CRISPR to find that segment of DNA and replace it. So the way that that works is that the target DNA with that faulty gene is identified, right? And so we do that with a segment of RNA that's going to be complementary to, uh, to that gene. Now, once that target DNA has been identified, it is going to be cut, okay, or cleaved. Those words mean the same thing. And then we need to make some DNA. So embedded within this CRISPR and Cas9 complex is going to be some RNA. That RNA can be transcribed into DNA, and then that DNA, that desirable version of the gene, can be inserted into the DNA. And so now that organism has a new or altered section of their DNA. 
And the second application is the elimination of genetic diseases. So just cutting out faulty alleles or genes altogether. So great examples of that are sickle cell anemia. So going in and cutting out that allele or that gene, um, or at least altering it, um, modifying plants to become more nutritious or tolerant. So if I insert a gene that allows a plant to be drought tolerant, wow, that would be great. So that's not really altering a gene, that's inserting a, a gene that that plant didn't even have to begin with. We can also use CRISPR and Cas9 to create infertile mosquitoes. So if you make male mosquitoes, for example, infertile by changing the gene necessary for gamete production, then you can cut down the mosquito population because you have so many males that are unable to breed. It could also happen with the females. It's just an example here. Now, CRISPR and Cas9, this use of this technology does of course come along with some ethical implications and considerations. So I urge you to look into that part a little bit further. Now, Theme D is all about continuity and change. Obviously, mutations and genetic modification is a great example of change, but what about continuity? Well, we have in our DNA some sequences that can be categorized as either conserved or highly conserved. Conserved sequences are base sequences that are identical across a species or a group of closely related species. So if we find that a, a, you know, a, a species um, all contains the same gene, we would expect that gene to be identical for all of them if it is a conserved sequence. Highly conserved sequences are base sequences that are identical over long periods of time and across a wider range of species. And highly conserved sequences tend to be things that code for things with unchanging functions. So like rRNA or tRNA, those functions have remained stable over very long periods of time and all organisms need them, right? So or almost, yeah, all organisms need them. So we would expect um, any mutation there to be harmful and not passed along. So in this case, they would be highly conserved, okay? Now, there are some highly conserved non-coding elements, but the functions are unclear. So it's really a mystery as to why they remain so highly conserved, why any changes seem to not be passed along. And they tend to be found in regions of the genome where mutations are rare. So there are several hypotheses there, a hypothesis um, that links back to the location of those conserved sequences. But again, I know genetic modification sounds like a lot of change, but it's a great idea to balance that with understanding how this um, can also result in continuity.